added missing pieces in gaps of the creation over time. In other words, I was still an anti-evolutionist. And it was at the end of my PhD, once more, on my knees, that I got a sense of God calling me. And the call came in the form of a question. Dennis, you want to be in the origins debate? And of course my answer was, yes, Lord. Well then, Dennis, how much evolutionary biology do you know? Ouch. I didn't much like that question because the answer was next to nothing because my science education was mostly in dentistry. However, because I had a dentistry background, I could enter a PhD on the evolution of teeth and jaws. So I returned to the University of Alberta in 1991 and I entered the program as an anti-evolutionist with the intention of collecting scientific evidence in order to destroy evolutionary theory once I had graduated. I didn't tell any of my professors or classmates my ultimate plan. I envisioned myself as going behind enemy lines because I still had that grand plan that I recorded in my diary on registration day at Regent College in 1984 which if you remember, was to declare absolute and pure hell on the theory. Well, what did I discover? I slowly started seeing a pattern with teeth across the fossil record. Let me give you a couple examples in the evolution from reptile teeth to mammalian teeth. Please go to the first page of your handout at the bottom right hand corner. Most reptiles have simple conical teeth. They bite their prey and they swallow it whole. On the other hand, most mammals have different types of teeth with different functions. In particular, the back teeth have complex biting points called cusps, and these interlock between the upper and lower jaws. This allows mammals to tear up and chew their prey and draw more nutrients than reptiles. So the question can be asked, is there scientific evidence for reptilian teeth evolving into mammalian teeth? And the answer is a resounding yes. In fact, there's an entire class of extinct creatures called mammal-like reptiles because scientists can't classify them as either reptiles or mammals. These are transitional animals, that is, animals in between reptiles and mammals. And of course, for many years, I would often hear in my church that there were no transitional fossils. Well, that's simply not true. In the first mammal-like reptile, you will notice the emergence of a large specialized tooth like the canine of the saber-toothed tiger. This gives the animal the advantage of a weapon to kill prey. Also note how the back teeth are curved backwards. Once the prey is in the mouth, it's caught and not getting out. In the second mammal-like reptile, the back teeth are starting to get pointed cusps that will allow the prey to be chewed upon and more nutrients drawn for the predator. Clearly there is a pattern from the teeth of reptiles to the teeth of mammals. Well, what about jaw evolution? Please go to the second page of your handout on the left side. And let's again use the evolution of reptiles to mammals. Reptiles have many bones in their lower jaw and their jaw joint is between the quadrate bone and the articular bone. However, mammals have only one bone in their lower jaw, and their jaw joint is between the squamosal bone and the dentary bone. So, how did the jaws evolve from reptiles to mammals? Again, the scientific evidence is found with the mammal-like reptiles. In the first mammal-like reptile, 
you will notice a reduction in the size of the angular and quadrate bones with an increase in the size of the dentary. In the second mammal-like reptile, these trends continue, but something absolutely amazing also appears. There is a new jaw joint between the squamosal bone and the dentary bone. In other words, this animal has two jaw joints, a reptilian jaw joint and a mammalian jaw joint. So here is a perfect example of a transitional creature in the fossil record. Let's look at some more scientific evidence that shocked my anti-evolutionary beliefs during my PhD in evolutionary biology. Please go to the second page of the handout, the right side. I began to discover a pattern in the fossil record between ancient fish and the first amphibians. As you can see, the basic body outline is quite similar, but it is the pattern of bones in the fish fin and the amphibian that is striking. The ancient fish had numerous bones in its front fin, and the reptile had a very short and flat front limb, similar in outline to a fin. And the question can be asked, how did the fish fin evolve into the amphibian limb? Once more, the fossil record offers us a perfect transitional creature known as the fish with fingers. This animal is definitely a fish, but notice the finger-like projections in the fin that are similar to the fingers in the amphibian. So during my PhD program, I was definitely seeing a pattern in the fossil record that was pointing me towards evolution. But science is not limited to discovering only patterns. It also wants to understand processes. In this case, how did fins evolve into limbs? I found the answer in the newly emerging scientific discipline of evolutionary developmental biology, or EVO-DEVO for short. This science focuses on the processes that occur during embryological development. In particular, it has been discovered that if the concentration of just one developmental molecule is changed during development, then dramatic changes can occur in the anatomy of an animal. Let me offer you an example. Please go to the second page of the handout at the bottom right-hand corner. This is the normal bone anatomy of a developing upper limb in a hen. By increasing the concentration of a molecule that appears during development, we can get radical changes in the anatomy, including the emergence of new bones. Therefore, during evolution, a small genetic change causing an increase or decrease of just one developmental molecule could result in a large change in the anatomy of an animal, like the changes I was seeing in the evolution of fish fins to amphibian limbs. And it was this evidence from Evo Devo for a process in evolution that was the key for my acceptance of evolution. I had earlier seen the fossil pattern for evolution, and now I had a process that could account for evolutionary change. I even have the email of the day I became an evolutionist. It was addressed to Terry Gray, a biochemist at Calvin College in Michigan. I had met him in the summer at the annual meeting of the American Scientific Affiliation. This is an organization of committed Christians who are also scientists. Terry was the first evangelical Christian I had met who was openly an evolutionist. Note the time, 10 minutes before midnight on New Year's Eve.